episode 661. Emma Book Talk begins at 10 minutes and 4 seconds. Emma begins in episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 661, Mildred. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons at patreon.com and our YouTube channel members at YouTube, Craftlet channel. This week, we would like to highlight the following patrons Laura Peacemaker, I love your last name, Rebecca S., Suzanne Friedman, Gail Clewer, and Lou Dunham. Thank you so much for your support. Could not do this without you. Well, hello. You may notice if you are watching this episode on YouTube that I am not on camera. And that is because I've had several very, very rough days and my head can't really tolerate the light right now. And I didn't want to not get this episode out. So here we are going ahead and over on YouTube, we'll show you screenshots of any of the useful things that I mention. But aside from that, the only other video is going to be me doing something crafty on the screen during the chapter audio. You may be wondering why I named this episode Mildred, and here's the thing. Thing two, <laughs> Aiden is working at a really cool thrift store in the area, and Aiden wound up surprising me with a antique Singer sewing machine. We looked it up. It's from 1903. It is a Sphinx 27, and her name is Mildred, which means it has really cool, like old style Art Deco Sphinx decals on it. And decals just sounds wrong because that sounds like something that we put on like Barbie play sets. These are silver and gold leaf decals that are underneath the layer of shellac that covers the body of those machines. So it's black body. It's got this beautiful gold and silver detailing. It is old, which means a lot of the nickel plating is kind of pockmarked, but Sucker works really nicely. I'm going through the process of dismantling it and cleaning all the pieces, and then I will be remantling it. And I wanted to bring it up because I know some of you have machines like this. So if you have any words of wisdom or... <laughs> well, I learned not to do that moments in your life and you want to share, please do email me at heather at craftlit.com or you can call us at 206-350-1642. And if you leave a voicemail and you just want to talk to me, you don't want to be played on the next podcast episode, let me know and I will not play your audio. And one of the nice things about Aiden doing this was once I did the dismantling, the pieces that need cleaning, I can do that in bed. So that has been my project this week. It even hurt to sew, hand sew, hand stitch things. It's It hasn't been a good couple days. Regardless, I have received several emails that I want to share with you. One from early in May, and I am so sorry, Heather, I did not see this come in. My Gmail's all fakakta. So sorry about that. However, this is what Heather had to say. In episode 693, regarding the term rubber, in bridge, a rubber is when one team reaches 100 points twice before the other team. A single game is worth different amounts of points depending on how it's bid. 100 can be achieved multiple ways or by several hands. So making a rubber, that would be two 100s, can be achieved in as few as two rounds if a team bids and makes a game. That would be five clubs, five diamonds, four hearts, four spades, or three no trump. Twice in a row. 
It can also take much longer if the two teams are bidding lower than game. That would be not taking enough tricks to make their bid. Suffice to say, it is not necessarily three games. So that was, honestly, I remember watching my grandmother play bridge, and it wasn't as complicated as cricket, but it also wasn't not as complicated as cricket for a small person. So I've been, I've always been kind of intimidated by bridge. Heather, this is the clearest piece of instruction I have ever read about a card game. Thank you so much. This now is all making sense to me. And I don't know if anybody else is as relieved as I am to actually know this now, but I honestly, I'm not making it up. Uh, that really floats my boat. Thank you. Thanks for sending that in. And again, sorry that I didn't get to that earlier. The other two emails are regarding, well, largely regarding cotton. At the end of the previous episode, episode 660, I put out a plea <laughs> to find replacement yarn for sugars and cream, and I got two very useful emails back about this. So I'm going to read both of them to you because they have different information in them. This is why I love you guys. You know, like collectively, we know everything. I just love that. So Sarah, she wrote, Heather, I just listened to your most recent Craftlet episode in which you were bemoaning the discontinuation of Lion Brand Cottonese. If you're looking for a very similar yarn, I really like Knit Picks Comfy. It comes in worsted weight as well as in sport weight and fingering. Like cotton ease, it's a blend of cotton and acrylic, which makes it comfortable to work with because it has a little more give than 100% cotton. If you're looking for an all cotton, I also really like their Dishy yarn. That's D-I-S-H-I-E. It's smoother, softer, and less splitty than sugar and cream or other dishcloth cottons. So thank you so much. I am not going to be buying yarn anytime soon, but now I know I can. And that is just a huge relief. So thank you. And then, as if that weren't enough, we also got an email from Barbara A. She wrote on several topics. Hi, Heather. I have been accumulating topics to write about, and today I have a chance to commit them to, well, not paper, but pixels, I guess. Firstly, a while back you mentioned that Emma is wealthier than Mr. Darcy. Not so. Ladies were said to have a certain fortune in pounds, which they would be able to bring into a marriage. However, the net worth of a gentleman, especially landowners like Mr. Darcy, couldn't be so easily specified. The convention was to mention their purported annual income instead, so you can see that Mr. Darcy's 10000 a year was very substantial indeed. So if I'm remembering, if I'm understanding this correctly, this is Mr. Darcy has 10,000 pounds a year coming in off of his investments and whatever principal income he's getting, like land leases and things like that. Whereas women, it's a one and done. You have 30,000 pounds. That's it. That's how much money you are taking into your marriage. And when it's done, it's done. And that makes a lot more sense to me. So thank you for that, Barbara. And then she said, second, I looked at beaver gloves and I found this glove rabbit hole. And we will link out to this for you in the show notes. Apparently beaver gloves, and that's in quotation marks, were just brown leather and nothing very special. So just kind of workaday brown leather gloves. Finally, I work with a lot of cotton yarn, both knitting and crocheting. I agree that sugar and cream yarn is not fun to work with and sympathize that cottonese has been discontinued. I thought about doing a Ravelry search with a very specific parameter, cotton blend, worsted weight, etc. You could try that, but another resource I had almost forgotten about is yarnsub.com, Y-A-R-N-S-U-B.com. I'm sure you can find something acceptable there. And then she added, that's it for now. I have always been lukewarm about Emma as an Austin heroine, but your commentary has made the book a lot more fun. The fact that she is so flawed is an opportunity for Austin's genius to really shine. Thanks for your podcast. You're one of the OGs. Which just made me laugh. Yes. <laughs> we in the podcasting world now are referring to people who've been around for a long time as OG podcasters. 
which if I'm remembering correctly from my day's teaching, is original gangsta, which I just love. Today, today we are doing chapter 26. We're only doing one. It's a long chapter. And yeah, it's a long chapter. So here's what I think you might want to know going into it. And then there are some things that you will hear during the chapter that I have not mentioned. And we'll talk about those because I know your ears are going to prick up and you're going to go, wait, what? A couple times. And we'll go over that at the end of today's chapter audio. You're going to hear references to Mr. Knightley using his carriage uh, several different ways, several different times over the course of the chapter today. And early on, there is a comment made that Mr. Knightley keeps no horses, but they talk about him having a carriage. This means he has the carriage. The carriage is expensive, but once you have it, you have it. He doesn't have horses for the carriage, plural, because why would you keep more horses than just one if you are walking most of the time? Mr. Knightley has no need for a team of horses so he can hire them when he needs to, so he can rent a horse <laughs> and use that as a way to propel his carriage. You will hear in today's chapter a reference to everybody at the party going in to dine. And the description seemed oddly specific to me. And I was having a hard time figuring it out. I read up, it turns out that in all of the, the movie versions of this era, and actually many older eras, in the movie versions that I remember seeing when people sat at table as part of a party, my memory was always that it was female, male, female, male, female, male, all the way down, with the hostess at one end and the host at the other, and that people were largely seated by their level in society, working their way to the middle where there was the, the people who had the, the least seniority in that, that society, in their class. It turns out that's not entirely true, that that male-female routine was kind of new by the uh, time of the French Revolution, maybe just after that, and that before that, if I'm understanding this correctly, the hostess would enter the dining room with the most high-ranked woman with her, and then all the other women would basically fall in line behind them and go to the end of the table where the hostess is going to sit, and they'd all fill in the space, and then the guys would come in. So women weren't always sitting next to guys prior to this, which I found really fascinating. I don't know how far that goes back. I cannot imagine that that was, you know, that that goes back to the Middle Ages or anything, but I thought it was interesting here. So when Jane Austen is writing this, the sitting women and men next to each other in an alternating pattern, that's really only been happening for about 20, 30 years at this point. So it just leads to commentary from Austin that I thought, like I said, was kind of pointed and I, it made me curious. So there's that. You are going to hear references to pianos. And here is where photographs on screen and photographs in show notes will help you somewhat because I didn't know some of this. Number one, you're going to hear about a Broadwood pianoforte, a square pianoforte. Okay. Square pianos, to me, look like what I thought a spinet is. It's not a tall piano. It's not a grand piano. It's not a baby grand piano. It's squared off, and therefore it has a, a lower profile. It it's, takes up less room vertically as well as horizontally on the floor, and they're really pretty. So we found some links with information about them as well as pictures. But the cool part is John Broadwood, 1732 to 1812, was the piano maker at the time. It's like the way people talk about Steinways now. It was a Broadwood piano, was a known thing, and was like top of the line. The cool part is Broadwood pianos are still being made. 
I know, right? I mean, what are the chances? How many of these companies have lasted this long? Not many. So Broadwood pianos, now you will start seeing references to them out in the world and you're welcome. And I mentioned spin it as a frame, kind of the, the size of the piano and the shape of the piano. But it turns out that spin it, at least back here, is a much more specific kind of piano. It was, instead of having three strings per hammer, per note, it only had one. So this was kind of the transition between a harpsichord and what we think of as a piano. There's this kind of spin it in there, kind of sneaking in on the side. And part of that was because it was cheaper. And so people who couldn't afford, you know, a big, lovely piano, at least they could still play. But obviously it's not going to be as loud. Piano forte, it's not going to be as loud and it's not going to be as easy to hear in a party of people. You also have to remember having a grand piano back then would be just like a grand piano now. It takes up a lot of real estate. So keep that in mind as well. You're going to hear a reference to corner dishes, which I thought was kind of interesting. Corner dishes were small dishes of accompanying food that you would have on the table, usually at the corners. I know it's shocking, but it was usually things like pickles and little small things that kind of gave the meal punctuation. And that's all that is. Heavy jokes. When you hear heavy jokes, think dad jokes. That's all. En passant, you're going to hear about somebody paying his compliments en passant, which just means in passing. Just no big deal. Just doing what you do because that's what you're supposed to do. Hello, thank you. It is also a rabbit hole because the <laughs> en passant is also the specific name for a specific chess move that involves the movement of pawns. And I am not going to go any further than that into the history of the phrase en passant. You will hear somebody referring to a hairstyle as outre, O-U-T-R-E-E. -E. It's saying something is so outre, kind of the flip side of au courant. It's like not the thing that's being done right now. It's kind of, it's almost like somebody who is being described this way is buying into a fad or they're just not, they're not quite as fashionable and as up to date as they would like to be. A reminder that Mr. Knightley's younger brother's oldest son, okay, Isabella and John, have an older son named Henry. And because Mr. Knightley is not married, Henry is technically the heir to Donwell Abbey, to the estate. So that actually comes up a couple times in this chapter today. And the last note is a fun one. I did not realize that waltzes, when they came out, were kind of like Elvis's pelvis. <laughs> they were dangerous dances because people were touching each other way too much. And if you watch the video, well, if you haven't watched the video of the people doing a historical recreation of a Jane Austen ball, like the Netherfield ball, but doing it at Chowton House, which was where Jane Austen's adopted by other people, brother Edward lived. If you haven't watched that, I'm linking out to it again so that you have a second chance to, to grab that link, because I'm also linking out to a video of three partners at a dance school dancing what the waltz would have looked like back in this era. And it is not the waltz that I think of when I think of waltzing. There's a scene in The Age of Innocence by Martin Scorsese's film where everybody's dancing at a dinner party. And when I think of waltzing, that is the kind of waltzing I think of. This, this was not that. It looked a little awkward. But regardless, you've seen the kind of English country dances. Those were mostly real dances where you had two lines of people and the people met at one end and then promenaded down to the end of the lines. And then that just kept going in a cycle. Or 
you had the line dances where men are on one side, women are on another, and you get into like groups of four and do dance steps together. Waltzes were quite obviously, Heather, two people dancing kind of close. So the reason why this cracked me up so much is one of the annotations in my copy of Emma includes poem by Lord Byron. So this is right after Child Harold came out. So he is newly famous and doesn't really have his reputation as a rake yet or as a Byronic hero. So he has the waltz, an apostrophic hymn. And apostrophic or apostrophe is an abstract comment or an absent person that you're talking to. So the poet is talking to a concept. Fear, stay away from me, love, come to me, that kind of thing. I haven't seen a whole lot of completely anastrophic poems before. I have often seen people make references like that, like to the love and to the fear, but not, not to this level. So let me share with you a little Lord Byron. Endearing waltz, to thine more melting tune bend Irish jig and ancient rigadoon. Scotch reels avaunt, and country dance forego your future claims to each fantastic toe. Waltz, waltz alone both legs and arms demands liberal of feet and lavish of her hands. Hands which may freely range in public sight. We're ne'er before, but pray, put out the light. Methinks the glare of yonder chandelier shines much too far, or I am much too near, and true, though strange, Waltz whispers this remark. My slippery steps are safest in the dark, but here the muse with decorum halts and lends her longest petticoat to Waltz. I love that. I want to memorize that. I just, oh my gosh. It's like To a Sick Rose, the poem that is all about sex, but you can still read it in AP English because it doesn't sound like it is. Oh, Lord Byron, you scamp. So I'm ending our pre-chapter notes here. This chapter, you will notice, kind of gets, in movie versions, kind of gets combined with the earlier dinner party scene that we had, where people were playing piano afterwards, you're going to see that again. And I think most movies combine those scenes because it makes sense in a film to do that. In the book, different and far more important information gets communicated to us because all these people are together in one place. So it makes a lot of sense that this, this particular dinner scene is happening right kind of in the middle of the book. All right, here we go with chapter 26. That's volume two, chapter eight of Jane Austen's Emma. If you are listening to your own version, please fast wind to 59 minutes and 10 seconds. All right, here we go. Volume two, chapter eight. Frank Churchill came back again, and if he kept his father's dinner waiting, it was not known at Hartfield, for Mrs. Weston was too anxious for his being a favourite with Mr. Woodhouse to betray any imperfection which could be concealed. He came back, had had his hair cut, and laughed at himself with a very good grace, but without seeming really at all ashamed of what he had done. He had no reason to wish his hair longer, to conceal any confusion of face, no reason to wish the money unspent to improve his spirits. He was quite as undaunted and as lively as ever, and after seeing him, Emma thus moralized to herself. "'I do not know whether it ought to be so, but certainly silly things do cease to be silly if they are done by sensible people in an impudent way.' Wickedness is always wickedness, but folly is not always folly. It depends upon the character of those who handle it. Mr. Knightley, he is not a trifling silly young man. If he were, he would have done this differently. He would either have gloried in the achievement, or been ashamed of it. There would have been either the ostentation of a coxcomb, or the evasions of a mind too weak to defend its own vanities. No— I am perfectly sure he is not trifling or silly. 
With Tuesday came the agreeable prospect of seeing him again, and for a longer time than hitherto, of judging of his general manners, and by inference of the meaning of his manners towards herself, of guessing how soon it might be necessary for her to throw coldness into her air, and of fancying what the observations of all those might be, who were now seeing them together for the first time. She meant to be very happy, in spite of the scene being laid at Mr. Cole's, and without being able to forget that among the failings of Mr. Elton, even in the days of his favour, none had disturbed her more than his propensity to dine with Mr. Cole. Her father's comfort was amply secured, Mrs. Bates as well as Mrs. Goddard being able to come, and her last pleasing duty before she left the house was to pay her respects to them as they sat together after dinner, and while her father was fondly noticing the beauty of her dress, to make the two ladies all the amends in her power by helping them to large slices of cake and full glasses of wine, for whatever unwilling self-denial his care of their constitution might have obliged them to practice during the meal. She had provided a plentiful dinner for them. She wished she could know that they had been allowed to eat it. She followed another carriage to Mr. Cole's door, and was pleased to see that it was Mr. Knightley's, for Mr. Knightley, keeping no horses, having little spare money and a great deal of health, activity, and independence, was too apt, in Emma's opinion, to get about as he could, and not use his carriage so often as became the owner of Donwell Abbey. She had an opportunity now of speaking her approbation while warm from her heart, for he stopped to hand her out. "'This is coming as you should do,' said she. "'Like a gentleman. I am quite glad to see you.' He thanked her, observing, "'How lucky that we should arrive at the same moment! For if we had met first in the drawing-room, I doubt whether you would have discerned me to be more of a gentleman than usual. You might not have distinguished how I came, by my look or manner.' "'Yes, I should. I am sure I should. There is always a look of consciousness or bustle when people come in a way which they know to be beneath them. You think you carry it off very well, I dare say, but with you it is a sort of bravado, an air of affected unconcern. I always observe it whenever I meet you under those circumstances. Now you have nothing to try for. You are not at all afraid of being supposed ashamed. You are not striving to look taller than anybody else.' "'Now I shall really be very happy to walk into the same room with you.' "'Nonsensical girl,' was his reply, but not at all in anger. Emma had as much reason to be satisfied with the rest of the party as with Mr. Knightley. She was received with a cordial respect which could not but please, and given all the consequence she could wish for. When the Westons arrived, the kindest looks of love, the strongest of admiration, were for her, from both husband and wife. The son approached her with a cheerful eagerness which marked her as his peculiar object, and at dinner she found him seated by her, and as she firmly believed, not without some dexterity on his side. The party was rather large, as it included one other family, a proper, unobjectionable country family, whom the Coles had the advantage of naming among their acquaintance, and the male part of Mr. Cox's family, the lawyer of Highbury. The less worthy females were to come in the evening, with Miss Bates, Miss Fairfax, and Miss Smith, but already at dinner they were too numerous for any subject of conversation to be general, and while politics and Mr. Elton were talked over, Emma could fairly surrender all her attention to the pleasantness of her neighbour. The first remote sound to which she felt herself obliged to attend was the name of Jane Fairfax. Mrs. Cole seemed to be relating something of her that was expected to be very interesting. She listened and found it well worth listening to. That very dear part of Emma, her fancy, received an amusing supply. Mrs. Cole was telling that she had been calling on Miss Bates, and as soon as she entered the room had been struck by the sight of a pianoforte, a very elegant-looking instrument, not a grand, but a large-sized square pianoforte, and the substance of the story, the end of all the dialogue which ensured of surprise and inquiry, and congratulations on her side, and explanation on Miss Bates's, was that this pianoforte had arrived from Broadwoods the day before, to the great astonishment of both aunt and niece, entirely unexpected, that at first, by Miss Bates's account, Jane herself was quite at a loss, quite bewildered to think who could possibly have ordered it, but now they were both perfectly satisfied that it could be from only one quarter. Of course, it must be from Colonel Campbell. "'One can suppose nothing else,' added Mrs. Cole, "'and I was only surprised that there could ever have been a doubt. 
"'But Jane, it seems, had a letter from them very lately, and not a word was said about it. She knows their ways best, but I should not consider their silence as any reason for their not meaning to make the present. They might choose to surprise her.' Mrs. Cole had many to agree with her. Everybody who spoke on the subject was equally convinced that it must come from Colonel Campbell, and equally rejoiced that such a present had been made, and there were enough ready to speak to allow Emma to think her own way, and still listen to Mrs. Cole. "'I declare I do not know when I have heard anything that has given me more satisfaction. It has always hurt me that Jane Fairfax, who plays so delightfully, should not have an instrument. It seemed quite a shame, especially considering how many houses there are where fine instruments are absolutely thrown away. This is like giving ourselves a slap, to be sure. And it was but yesterday I was telling Mr. Cole. I really was ashamed to look at our new grand pianoforte in the drawing-room, while I do not know one note from another.' and our little girls, who are but just beginning, perhaps may never make anything of it. And there is poor Jane Fairfax, who is mistress of music, has not anything of the nature of an instrument, not even the pitifulest old spinet in the world to amuse herself with. I was saying this to Mr. Cole but yesterday, and he quite agreed with me, only he is so particularly fond of music that he could not help indulging himself in the purchase, hoping that some of our good neighbours might be so obliging occasionally to put it to better use than we can, and that really is the reason why the instrument was bought, or else I am sure we ought to be ashamed of it. We are in great hopes that Miss Woodhouse may be prevailed with to try it this evening." Miss Woodhouse made the proper acquiescence, and finding that nothing more was to be entrapped from any communication of Mrs. Cole's, turned to Frank Churchill. "'Why do you smile?' said she. "'Nay, why do you?' "'Me? I suppose I smile for pleasure at Colonel Campbell's being so rich and so liberal. It is a handsome present.' "'Very.' "'I rather wonder that it was never made before.' Perhaps Miss Fairfax has never been staying here so long before. Or that he did not give her the use of their own instrument, which must now be shut up in London, untouched by anybody. That is a grand pianoforte, and he might think it too large for Mrs. Bates's house. You may say what you choose, but your countenance testifies that your thoughts on this subject are very much like mine. I do not know. I rather believe you are giving me more credit for acuteness than I deserve. I smile because you smile, and shall probably suspect whatever I find you suspect. But at present I do not see what there is to question. If Colonel Campbell is not the person, who can be? What do you say to Mrs. Dixon? Mrs. Dixon? Very true indeed. I had not thought of Mrs. Dixon. She must know, as well as her father, how acceptable an instrument would be. And perhaps the mode of it, the mystery, the surprise, is more like a young woman's scheme than an elderly man's. It is, Mrs. Dixon, I dare say. I told you that your suspicions would guide mine. If so, you must extend your suspicions, and comprehend Mr. Dixon in them. Mr. Dixon? Very well. Yes, I immediately perceive that it must be the joint present of Mr. and Mrs. Dixon. We were speaking the other day, you know, of his being so warm an admirer of her performance. Yes, and what you told me on that head confirmed an idea which I had entertained before. I do not mean to reflect upon the good intentions of either Mr. Dixon or Miss Fairfax, but I cannot help suspecting either that, after making his proposals to her friend, he had the misfortune to fall in love with her, or that he became conscious of a little attachment on her side. One might guess twenty things without guessing exactly the right, but I am sure there must be a particular cause for her choosing to come to Highbury instead of going with the Campbells to Ireland. Here she must be leading a life of privation and penance, there it would have been all enjoyment." As to the pretence of trying her native air, I look upon that as a mere excuse. In the summer it might have passed, but what can anybody's native air do for them in the months of January, February, and March? Good fires and carriages would be much more to the purpose in most cases of delicate health, and I dare say in hers. I do not require you to adopt all my suspicions, though you make so noble a profession of doing it, but I honestly tell you what they are and upon my word, they have an air of great probability. Mr. Dixon's preference of her music to her friends, I can answer for being very decided. And then he saved her life. Did you ever hear of that? A water-party, 
and by some accident she was falling overboard. He caught her. He did. I was there, one of the party. Were you really? Well. But you observed nothing, of course, for it seems to be a new idea to you. If I had been there, I think I should have rather made some discoveries. I dare say you would, but I, simple I, saw nothing but the fact that Miss Fairfax was very nearly dashed from the vessel and that Mr. Dixon caught her. It was the work of a moment. And though the consequent shock and alarm was very great and much more durable, indeed I believe it was half an hour before any of us were comfortable again, yet that was too general a sensation for anything of peculiar anxiety to be observable. I do not mean to say, however, that you might not have made discoveries. The conversation was here interrupted. They were called on to share in the awkwardness of a rather long interval between the courses, and obliged to be as formal and as orderly as the others. But when the table was again safely covered, when every corner dish was placed exactly right, and occupation and ease were generally restored, Emma said, "'The arrival of this pianoforte is decisive with me. I wanted to know a little more, and this tells me quite enough. Depend upon it, we shall soon hear that it is a present from Mr. and Mrs. Dixon.' "'And if the Dixon should absolutely deny all knowledge of it, we must conclude it to come from the Campbells.' "'No, I am sure it is not from the Campbells. Miss Fairfax knows it is not from the Campbells, or they would have been a guest at first. She would not have been puzzled had she dared fix on them. I may not have convinced you, perhaps, but I am perfectly convinced myself that Mr. Dixon is a principal in the business.' "'Indeed, you injure me if you suppose me unconvinced. Your reasonings carry my judgment along with them entirely. At first, while I supposed you satisfied that Colonel Campbell was the giver, I saw it only as paternal kindness, and thought it the most natural thing in the world. But when you mentioned Mrs. Dixon, I felt how much more probable that it should be the tribute of warm female friendship, and now I can see it in no other light than as an offering of love.' There was no occasion to press the matter farther. The conviction seemed real. He looked as if he felt it. She said no more. Other subjects took their turn, and the rest of the dinner passed away. The dessert succeeded. The children came in, and were talked to and admired amid the usual rate of conversation. A few clever things said, a few downright silly, but by much the larger proportion neither the one nor the other. Nothing worse than everyday remarks, dull repetitions, old news, and heavy jokes. The ladies had not been long in the drawing-room before the other ladies, in their different divisions, arrived. Emma watched the entree of her own particular little friend, and if she could not exult in her dignity and grace, she could not only love the blooming sweetness and the artless manner, but could most heartily rejoice in that light, cheerful, unsentimental disposition which allowed her so many alleviations of pleasure in the midst of the pangs of disappointed affection. There she sat, and who would have guessed how many tears she had lately been shedding? To be in company, nicely dressed herself, and seeing others nicely dressed, to sit and smile and look pretty and say nothing, was enough for the happiness of the present hour. Jane Fairfax did look and move superior, but Emma suspected she might have been glad to change feelings with Harriet, very glad to have purchased the mortification of having loved, yes, of having loved even Mr. Elton in vain, by the surrender of all the dangerous pleasure of knowing herself beloved by the husband of her friend. In so large a party it was not necessary that Emma should approach her. She did not wish to speak of the pianoforte. She felt too much in the secret herself to think the appearance of curiosity or interest fair, and therefore purposely kept at a distance. But by the others the subject was almost immediately introduced, and she saw the blush of consciousness with which congratulations were received, the blush of guilt which accompanied the name of "'My excellent friend, Colonel Campbell.' Mrs. Weston, kind-hearted and musical, was particularly interested by the circumstance, and Emma could not help being amused at her perseverance in dwelling on the subject, and having so much to ask and to say as to tone, touch, and pedal, wholly unsuspicious of that wish of saying as little about it as possible, which she plainly read in the fair heroine's countenance. They were soon joined by some of the gentlemen, and the very first of the early was Frank Churchill. In he walked, the first and the handsomest, and after paying his compliments on passant to Miss Bates and her niece, made his way directly to the opposite side of the circle, where sat Miss Woodhouse, and till he could find a seat by her, would not sit at all. 
Emma divined what everybody present must be thinking. She was his object, and everybody must perceive it. She introduced him to her friend Miss Smith, and at convenient moments afterwards heard what each thought of the other. He had never seen so lovely a face, and was delighted with her naivete. And she— only to be sure it was paying him too great a compliment, but she did think there were some looks a little like Mr. Elton. Emma restrained her indignation, and only turned from her in silence. Smiles of intelligence passed between her and the gentleman, on first glancing towards Miss Fairfax, but it was most prudent to avoid speech. He told her that he had been impatient to leave the dining-room, hated sitting long, was always the first to move when he could, that his father, Mr. Knightley, Mr. Cox, and Mr. Cole, were left very busy over parish business, that as long as he had stayed, however, it had been pleasant enough, as he had found them in general a set of gentlemanlike, sensible men, and spoke so handsomely of Highbury altogether, thought it so abundant and agreeable families, that Emma began to feel she had been used to despise the place rather too much. She questioned him as to the society in Yorkshire, the extent of the neighbourhood about Enscombe and the sort, and could make out from his answers that as far as Enscombe was concerned there was very little going on, that their visitings were among a range of great families, none very near, and that even when days were fixed, and invitations accepted, it was an even chance that Mrs. Churchill was not in health and spirits for going, that they made a point of visiting no fresh person— and that, though he had his separate engagements, it was not without difficulty, without considerable address at times, that he could get away, or introduce an acquaintance for a night. She saw that Enscombe could not satisfy, and that Highbury, taken at its best, might reasonably please a young man who had more retirement at home than he liked. His importance at Enscombe was very evident— he did not boast, but it naturally betrayed itself, that he had persuaded his aunt where his uncle could do nothing, and on her laughing and noticing it, he owned that he believed, excepting one or two points, he could with time persuade her to anything. One of those points on which his influence failed, he then mentioned, he had wanted very much to go abroad, had been very eager indeed to be allowed to travel, but she would not hear of it. This had happened the year before. Now, he said, he was beginning to have no longer the same wish." The unpersuadable point, which he did not mention, Emma guessed to be good behaviour to his father. "'I have made a most wretched discovery,' said he, after a short pause. "'I have been here a week to-morrow, half my time. I never knew days fly so fast. A week to-morrow, and I have hardly begun to enjoy myself, but just got acquainted with Mrs. Weston and others. I hate the recollection.' "'Perhaps you may now begin to regret that you spent one whole day out of so few in having your hair cut.' "'No,' said he, smiling, "'that is no subject of regret at all. I have no pleasure in seeing my friends unless I can believe myself fit to be seen.' The rest of the gentlemen being now in the room, Emma found herself obliged to turn from him for a few minutes, and listen to Mr. Cole. When Mr. Cole had turned away, and her attention could be restored as before, she saw Frank Churchill looking intently across the room at Miss Fairfax, who was sitting exactly opposite. "'What is the matter?' said she. He started. "'Thank you for rousing me,' he replied. "'I believe I have been very rude. But really Miss Fairfax has done her hair in so odd a way, so very odd a way, that I cannot keep my eyes from her. I never saw anything so outré those curls! This must be a fancy of her own. I see nobody else looking like her. I must go and ask her whether it is an Irish fashion. Shall I? Yes, I will. I declare I will, and you shall see how she takes it, whether she colours. He was gone immediately, and Emma soon saw him standing before Miss Fairfax and talking to her— but as to its effect on the young lady, as he had improvidently placed himself exactly between them, exactly in front of Miss Fairfax, she could absolutely distinguish nothing. Before he could return to his chair, it was taken by Mrs. Weston. "'This is the luxury of a large party,' said she. "'One can get near everybody and say everything. My dear Emma, I am longing to talk to you. I have been making discoveries and forming plans, just like yourself, and I must tell them while the idea is fresh. Do you know how Miss Bates and her niece came here? How? They were invited, were not they? Oh, yes, but how they were conveyed hither, the manner of their coming. 
They walked, I conclude. How else could they come? Very true. Well, a little while ago it occurred to me how very sad it would be to have Jane Fairfax walking home again late at night, and cold as the nights are now. And as I looked at her, though I never saw her appear to more advantage, it struck me that she was heated, and would therefore be particularly liable to take cold. Poor girl! I could not bear the idea of it. So as soon as Mr. Weston came into the room and I could get at him, I spoke to him about the carriage. You may guess how readily he came into my wishes, and having his approbation I made my way directly to Miss Bates, to assure her that the carriage would be at her service before it took us home, for I thought it would be making her comfortable at once. Good soul! She was as grateful as possible, you may be sure. Nobody was ever so fortunate as herself, but with many, many thanks. There was no occasion to trouble us, for Mr. Knightley's carriage had brought and was to take them home again. I was very surprised, very glad, I am sure, but really quite surprised. Such a very kind attention, and so thoughtful an attention, the sort of thing that so few men would think of, and in short, from knowing his usual ways— I am very much inclined to think that it was for their accommodation the carriage was used at all. I do suspect he would not have had a pair of horses for himself, and that it was only an excuse for assisting them. "'Very likely,' said Emma. "'Nothing more likely. I know no man more likely than Mr. Knightley to do the sort of thing, to do anything really good-natured, useful, considerate, or benevolent. He is not a gallant man, but he is a very humane one.' and this, considering Jane Fairfax's ill health, would appear a case of humanity to him. And for an act of unostentatious kindness, there is nobody whom I would fix on more than Mr. Knightley. I know he had horses to-day, for we arrived together, and I laughed at him about it, but he said not a word that could betray. "'Well,' said Mrs. Weston, smiling, "'you give him credit for more simple disinterested benevolence in this instance than I do.' For while Miss Bates was speaking, a suspicion darted into my head, and I have never been able to get it out again. The more I think of it, the more probable it appears. In short, I have made a match between Mr. Knightley and Jane Fairfax. See the consequence of keeping you company. What do you say to it? "'Mr. Knightley and Jane Fairfax!' exclaimed Emma. "'Dear Mrs. Weston, how could you think of such a thing?' "'Mr. Knightley! Mr. Knightley must not marry. You would not have little Henry cut out from Donwell. Oh, no, no, Henry must have Donwell. I cannot at all consent to Mr. Knightley's marrying, and I am sure it is not at all likely. I am amazed that you should think of such a thing.' "'My dear Emma, I have told you what led me to think of it. I do not want the match. I do not want to injure little Henry.' But the idea has been given me by circumstances, and if Mr. Knightley really wished to marry, you would not have him refrain on Henry's account, a boy of six years old who knows nothing of the matter. Yes, I would. I could not bear to have Henry supplanted. Mr. Knightley marry? No, I have never had such an idea, and I cannot adopt it now. And Jane Fairfax, too, of all women. Nay, she has always been a first favourite with him, as you very well know. But the imprudence of such a match! I am not speaking of its prudence, merely its probability. I see no probability in it, unless you have any better foundation than what you mention. His good nature, his humanity, as I tell you, would be quite enough to account for the horses. He has a great regard for the Bates, as you know, independent of Jane Fairfax, and is always glad to show them attention. My dear Mrs. Weston, do not take to match-making. You do it very ill. Jane Fairfax, mistress of the Abbey. Oh, no, no, every feeling revolts. For his own sake I would not have him do so mad a thing. Imprudent, if you please, but not mad. Excepting inequality of fortune and perhaps a little disparity of age, I can see nothing unsuitable. But Mr. Knightley does not want to marry. I am sure he has not the least idea of it. Do not put it into his head. Why should he marry? He is as happy as possible by himself, with his farm and his sheep and his library, and all the parish to manage, and he is extremely fond of his brother's children. He has no occasion to marry, either to fill up his time or his heart. My dear Emma, as long as he thinks so, it is so. But if he really loves Jane Fairfax— 
"'Nonsense! He does not care about Jane Fairfax. In the way of love, I am sure he does not. He would do any good to her or her family, but—well,' said Mrs. Weston, laughing, "'perhaps the greatest good he could do them would be to give Jane such a respectable home.' "'If it would be good to her, I am sure it would be evil to himself, a very shameful and degrading connection. How would he bear to have Miss Bates belonging to him, to have her haunting the Abbey and thanking him all day long for his great kindness in marrying Jane, so very kind and obliging, but he has always been such a very kind neighbour, and then fly off through half a sentence to her mother's old petticoat. Not that it was such a very old petticoat, either, for still it would last a great while, and indeed she must say thankfully that their petticoats were all very strong. For shame, Emma, do not mimic her. You divert me against my conscience, and upon my word I do not think Mr. Knightley would be much disturbed by Miss Bates. Little things do not irritate him. She might talk on, and if he wanted to say anything himself he would only talk louder and drown her voice. But the question is not whether it be a bad connection for him, but whether he wishes it, and I think he does. I have heard him speak, and so must you, so very highly of Jane Fairfax. The interest he's taken in her, his anxiety about her health, his concern that she should have no happier prospect. I have heard him express himself so warmly on those points, such an admirer of her performance on the pianoforte, and of her voice. I have heard him say that he could listen to her for ever. Oh, and I had almost forgotten one idea that occurred to me. This pianoforte that has been sent here by somebody, though we have all been so well satisfied to consider it a present from the Campbells, may it not be from Mr. Knightley? I cannot help suspecting him. I think he is just the person to do it, even without being in love. Then it could be no argument to prove that he is in love. But I do not think it is at all a likely thing for him to do. Mr. Knightley does nothing mysteriously. I have heard him lamenting her having no instrument repeatedly, oftener than I should suppose such a circumstance would, in the common course of things, occur to him. Very well, and if he had intended to give her one, he would have told her so. There might be scruples of delicacy, my dear Emma. I have a very strong notion that it comes from him. I am sure he was particularly silent when Mrs. Cole told us of it at dinner. You take up an idea, Mrs. Weston, and run away with it, as you have many a time reproached me with doing. I see no sign of attachment. I believe nothing of the pianoforte, and proof shall only convince me that Mr. Knightley has any thought of marrying Jane Fairfax. They combated the point some time longer in the same way, Emma rather gaining ground over the mind of her friend, for Mrs. Weston was the most used of the two to yield, till a little bustle in the room showed them that tea was over, and the instrument in preparation, and at the same moment Mr. Cole approaching to entreat Miss Woodhouse would do them the honour of trying it. Frank Churchill, of whom, in the eagerness of her conversation with Mrs. Weston, she had been seeing nothing, except that he had found a seat by Miss Fairfax, followed Mr. Cole to add his very pressing entreaties, and as, in every respect, it suited Emma best to lead, she gave a very proper compliance. She knew the limitations of her own powers too well to attempt more than she could perform with credit. She wanted neither taste nor spirit in the little things which are generally acceptable, and could accompany her own voice well. One accompaniment to her song took her agreeably by surprise, a second, slightly but correctly taken by Frank Churchill. Her pardon was duly begged at the close of the song, and everything usual followed. He was accused of having a delightful voice, and a perfect knowledge of music, which was properly denied, and that he knew nothing of the matter, and had no voice at all, roundly asserted. They sang together once more, and Emma would then resign her place to Miss Fairfax, whose performance, both vocal and instrumental, she never could attempt to conceal from herself, was infinitely superior to her own. With mixed feelings she seated herself at a little distance from the numbers round the instrument to listen. Frank Churchill sang again. They had sung together once or twice, it appeared, at Weymouth. But the sight of Mr. Knightley among the most attentive soon drew away half Emma's mind, and she fell into a train of thinking on the subject of Mrs. Weston's suspicions, to which the sweet sounds of the united voices gave only momentary interruptions. Her objections to Mr. Knightley's marrying did not in the least subside. She could see nothing but evil in it. It would be a great disappointment to Mr. John Knightley, consequently to Isabella, a real injury to the children, 
a most mortifying change, and material loss to them all, a very great deduction from her father's daily comfort, and as to herself she could not at all endure the idea of Jane Fairfax at Donwell Abbey, a Mrs. Knightley for them all to give way to. No, Mr. Knightley must never marry. Little Henry must remain the heir of Donwell. Presently Mr. Knightley looked back and came and sat down by her. They talked at first only of the performance. His admiration certainly was very warm, yet she thought but for Mrs. Weston it would not have struck her. As a sort of touchstone, however, she began to speak of his kindness in conveying the aunt and niece, and though his answer was in the spirit of cutting the matter short, she believed it to indicate only his disinclination to dwell on any kindness of his own. "'I often feel concern,' said she, "'that I dare not make our carriage more useful on such occasions. It is not that I am without the wish, but you know how impossible my father would deem it that James should put to for such a purpose.' "'Quite out of the question, quite out of the question,' he replied. "'But you must often wish it, I am sure.' And he smiled with such seeming pleasure at the conviction that she must proceed another step. "'This present from the Campbells,' said she, "'this pianoforte is very kindly given.' "'Yes,' he replied, and without the smallest apparent embarrassment. "'But they would have done better had they given her notice of it.' Surprises are foolish things. The pleasure is not enhanced, and the inconvenience is often inconsiderable. I should have expected better judgment in Colonel Campbell. From that moment Emma could have taken her oath that Mr. Knightley had had no concern in giving the instrument. But whether he were entirely free from peculiar attachment, whether there were no actual preference, remained a little longer doubtful. Toward the end of Jane's second song, her voice grew thick. "'That will do.' said he, when it was finished, thinking aloud. "'You have sung quite enough for one evening. Now be quiet.' Another song, however, was soon begged for. "'One more they would not fatigue Miss Fairfax on any account, and would only ask for one more.' And Frank Churchill was heard to say, "'I think you could manage this without effort. The first part is so very trifling. The strength of the song falls on the second. Mr. Knightley grew angry. "'That fellow,' said he, indignantly, thinks of nothing but showing off his own voice. This must not be. And touching Miss Bates, who at that moment passed near, Miss Bates, are you mad to let your niece sing herself hoarse in this manner? Go and interfere. They have no mercy on her. Miss Bates, in her real anxiety for Jane, could hardly stay even to be grateful, before she stepped forward and put an end to all farther singing. Here ceased the concert part of the evening, for Miss Woodhouse and Miss Fairfax were the only young lady performers, but soon, within five minutes, the proposal of dancing, originating nobody knew exactly where, was so effectually promoted by Mr. and Mrs. Cole that everything was rapidly clearing away to give proper space. Mrs. Weston, capital in her country dances, was seated, and beginning an irresistible waltz, and Frank Churchill, coming up with most becoming gallantry to Emma, had secured her hand and led her to the top. While waiting till the other young people could pair themselves off, Emma found time, in spite of the compliment she was receiving on her voice and her taste, to look about, and see what became of Mr. Knightley. This would be a trial. He was no dancer in general. If he were to be very alert in engaging Jane Fairfax now, it might augur something. There was no immediate appearance. No. He was talking to Mrs. Cole. He was looking on unconcerned. Jane was asked by somebody else, and he was still talking to Mrs. Cole. Emma had no longer an alarm for Henry, his interest was yet safe, and she led off the dance with genuine spirit and enjoyment. Not more than five couple could be mustered, but the rarity and the suddenness of it made it very delightful, and she found herself well matched in a partner. They were a couple worth looking at. Two dances, unfortunately, were all that could be allowed. It was growing late, and Miss Bates became anxious to get home on her mother's account. After some attempts, therefore, to be permitted to begin again, they were obliged to thank Mrs. Weston, look sorrowful, and have done. "'Perhaps it is as well,' said Frank Churchill, as he attended Emma to her carriage. "'I must have asked Miss Fairfax, and her languid dancing would not have agreed with me after yours.'" End of chapter 8 Heather from the future or Heather after editing has already taken place. I totally forgot to share. Laura Ricketts sent a link to a podcast covering more about Beaver than probably anyone really needs. But just in case, we have a link out to that too. So we have links to all the Beaver things 
for you. And before I forget again, we'd been talking on Facebook and in Patreon about doing a mid-book live stream. And next week is the actual middle of the book, but I think we might need to wait a little bit longer to get through another couple chapters. So if you are interested in joining us on a live stream, like live and in person, all of us together talking about books, and Emma specifically, keep your ears open, keep your eyes open, and make sure that you're signed up for the newsletter. We don't send newsletters off, and you will seriously never get spammed by us. But mid-month and then end of month, we try and make sure that we get information out to you about fun things like this. Also, another fun thing, Bleak House. The first 15 chapters of Bleak House, the first 15 of 400 million chapters of Bleak House are up on Patreon now. So they should be available on the app and also on Patreon. Thank you, Eric, who moved mountains to make that happen quickly. Really appreciate that. And I have the book for this month for our Patreon book club is The Big Sleep, and that will be next Thursday. I think the book and movie combo we will do for August and September will be Evelyn Waugh's Brideheads Revisited, and then at least some of the Jeremy Irons Bride's Head. I, I would love to do some of Evelyn Waugh's more biting, satiric, hard, funny books, but I don't know that there's ever been a good movie version of it, and I'm kind of enjoying doing the book and movie pairing thing. So for now, we'll just do Bride's Head and Bride's Head the Show with Jeremy Irons and Anthony Andrews and gorgeous people in gorgeous clothing. It's kind of like Bridgerton a hundred years later. It's just beautiful people. Okay, so going back to the near the beginning of the chapter. So Emma and Mr. Knightley meet. He helps her out of her carriage. He, she says, rarely takes a carriage on his own when it's, you know, just him going to a party. So she notes it because this is something he's done before. You may have heard the kind of passing glance at propriety the less worthy females were invited to come after dinner. So the Bateses and Jane Fairfax, they came after dinner for the party that followed, the musical time and time to sit and chat, but they were not invited to the dinner itself. Take that as thou wilt. It's a big deal that the Coles have a grand piano, because not only do they make it very clear that they have a grand piano, but they also have a room for it. And that's really quite something. So when they said Mr. Cole has come up in the world, he's really doing quite well for himself to be able to afford a home that has that kind of size and opportunity in it. I was loving the little cat and mouse game between Emma and Frank Churchill over dinner when Frank was asking her questions about Jane Fairfax, and Emma finally says to somebody else out loud, I think it's Mr. Dixon. And his responses were very interesting. One of the things that I thought was really interesting Austinian writing was there's a long paragraph of Emma just babbling at Frank Churchill. And she's talking about how it wouldn't have done Jane Fairfax any good to go to Ireland this time of the year, January, February, and March, good fires and carriages would be much more to the purpose in most cases of delicate health, and I dare say in her. I do not require you to adopt all my suspicions, though you make so noble a profession of doing it, but I honestly tell you what they are. What did his face look like? After this long description, what must his face have looked like to get Emma to suddenly pivot and say, I don't require you to accept all of my suspicions. You don't have to agree with me. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's really nice that you're acting like you do agree with me. And it's just little subtle things like that. Oh, Jane Austen, I love you so. There was also a hint dropped that while the Coles have a lot of money and a beautiful home and all that is good and right and proper in the world, they also have servants who haven't really gotten their routine down yet. The conversation was here interrupted. They were called on to share in the awkwardness of a rather long interval between the courses. 
and obliged to be as formal and as orderly as the others. So they were a little late getting dishes to the table, is what they're letting us know. And I thought, oof. I also enjoyed Emma's description of the kids coming down and saying hello to all of the dinner guests. And that she said the children came in and were talked to and admired amid the usual rate of conversation. A few clever things said, a few downright silly, but by much the larger proportion, neither the one nor the other. Nothing worse than everyday remarks, dull repetitions, old news, and heavy jokes, which, you know, is drawn out and labored jokes and, I think, dad joke when I read that. And in another doth protest too much moment, Frank seems to be making a big deal out of Jane Fairfax, both in talking to her and talking down about her, which seems like a lot of him talking about Jane Fairfax. I thought it was important that we hear in this chapter Mrs. Weston mimicking Miss Bates. She said, when she was talking about Knightley letting the Bateses and Jane Fairfax use his carriage to get to and from the party. I thought it would be making her comfortable at once. Good soul. She was as grateful as possible, you may be sure. Nobody was ever so fortunate as herself, but with many, many thanks. And that's in inner quotation marks. That's her actually mimicking, saying, parroting what Miss Bates usually says. Nobody was ever so fortunate. So there's one. But then Emma does it as well later. When she's talking to Mrs. Weston about Mr. Knightley being interested in Jane Fairfax and her having also protested quite a lot about that, she said, how would he bear to have Miss Bates belonging to him, to have her haunting the Abbey and thanking him all day long for his great kindness in marrying Jane? So very kind and obliging, but he always has been such a very kind neighbor, and then fly off through half a sentence to her mother's old petticoat. Not that it was such a very old petticoat, either, but it still would last a great while, and indeed, she must thankfully say that their petticoats were all very strong. And then goes off to say that... <laughs> <laughs> Nightly, the way Knightley would have to wind up dealing with that is to talk louder and drown out her voice. And again, those show up in quotation marks. That's Emma poking fun at Miss Bates. I also thought that Emma's response to the possibility of Knightley having the hots for Jane Fairfax was flimsy at best as a way to explain her reaction to this concept. That she flies off the handle a little bit and then reins it back in and says she's only thinking about little Henry. And I thought, uh-huh. Uh-huh. But I also thought it was interesting that Mrs. Weston is the one who brought up Knightley and Jane Fairfax, because that's, that's an indication of their friendship, their level of friendship, both before and after Mrs. Weston got married. They're gossiping and spinning out possibilities for other people's lives. Mrs. Weston is doing it too. And Emma calls her on it, saying, you take up an idea, Mrs. Weston, and run away with it, as you have many a time reproached me with doing. So, interesting. Where did Emma learn this from? Dun, dun, da, da. You can never think bad about Mrs. Weston, or Miss Taylor. She's just too sweet a character, but I thought that was kind of pointed. Also, the comment that of the two of them, Mrs. Weston was the most likely to yield, to give in and say, no, 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 you're probably right. Emma would not be the one to give in. And then we have the scene of them playing piano. First, Emma, who does tolerably well. She certainly is fine. She's fine. That's fine. Frank does an interesting thing without being invited he starts singing softly, but he's still singing so people can hear him. The harmony to Emma's melody, which would surprise me were I playing a solo and, you know, performing for everybody kind of thing, providing the evening's entertainment. And then woof, here he comes, but he sounds good and he does a good job. He was accused of having a delightful voice and a perfect knowledge of music, which, again, I just love that that's the juxtaposition of the two words, accused of having a delightful voice. 
But then Mr. Knightley really does kind of come to the rescue of Jane Fairfax. The way he talks about the gift of the piano reminded me of people who have given puppies as presents, like at Christmas. It's a horrible idea. You don't know that the family can handle it, can take care of it. You don't know if the dog is going to get along with the family. It's a bad idea for a present. And his his statement that surprises are foolish things. I thought, oh my gosh, it is. It's just like that. You don't know. You just don't know. Stick to safe gifts unless you know. And the piano, did they even have room for it? I mean, this is crazy. I also thought it was genius that when Mr. Knightley realizes that Jane Fairfax is getting tired and everybody is making her keep playing, they they want more from her. Knightley gets really ticked off. And how does he deal with it? Does he go head on and tell everybody to cool it? No. He goes to Miss Bates and says, really? Jane's looking tired and done and dusted, taken care of because Miss Bates is on point for rescuing Jane. But again, it came from Knightley. And I just, I thought that was a lovely, a lovely, lovely twist to his character. We are gradually seeing so much more of his character, but just in these little slices, these little ways all the way along. Now, I mentioned the thing about waltzes, but one of the the other things to know about waltzes, which I didn't want to labor you with beforehand, was that at this time, yes, there were waltzes, and yes, they were being introduced to England. That's true. However, some of the ways that they were introduced to England was the music itself was tweaked to make it sound more like a country dance. And in fact, if you watch the video, uh, three partners doing a Austinian era waltz, you can kind of hear what's going on with the, the music that way. It's kind of taking the grandness of the waltz and bringing it back down to a dance that could be done with less space, quite honestly. Also, not a surprise because they really only have a piano here and and Mrs. Weston is the one who knows the waltzes by heart, which I also loved. There's a lot of character information in this chapter. And of course, the dancing has to continue, and Frank is one of the ones making sure it continues. And there's the comment that Emma and Frank Churchill were a couple worth looking at. And then when the, the party breaks up and Jane Fairfax has to go, Frank said, perhaps it is as well as he attended Emma to her carriage. I must have asked Miss Fairfax if we had been going any longer, and her languid dancing would not have agreed with me after yours. So, you know, you're just too, 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 too awesome, Emma, and Jane will pale by comparison. So it would have been a downer. One of the other things that I found for you that we've linked out to is a website about English dancing. They're actually extant dancing manuals. I've taken a screenshot from one of their pages and we've linked out to the entire document if you want to go look at it. But yeah, it was kind of cool to see how we've talked many times before about dance information being shared and people being taught how to do the dances. This is how that was accomplished. So that is it for us. And don't forget the Thursday next that would be the last Thursday of the month of June. That will be the night that we meet to discuss the book, The Big Sleep. And if you are either a Jane Eyre tier person on Patreon, or if you have the premium feed on the Craftlet app, but you're also a Walter Hartwright over on Patreon, let us know because you need to be given access to our book talk. And already a couple of people have contacted me. And so we're getting that all set up so that they can join in the fun on Thursday night. I'm very excited about the big sleep. I've been doing some research into that as well. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. All right. That's it for me. I'm going to go lie down. You have a great week. I will talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes.
thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.